Welcome to episode 13 of the Camera Shake podcast with me, Kirsten Lutz, and Nick Kirby. It's episode 13. What could possibly go wrong? How are you today, Nick? Tired. <laughs> Tired. <laughs> no, good. Really good. A um, little worn out, but generally very, very good. The uh, work we were talking about last week is finally over, and that's great. It went off flawlessly. Yeah, two weeks without sleep. Pretty much. Pretty much. But it's what needs to be done, and the work's paid off. So I'm yeah. really pleased with the result that we got. Yeah. Uh, it's for all of those who haven't seen uh, or, or listened to last week's episode, um, Nick and myself, we were uh, working on a um, musical project, uh, which basically consisted of literally hundreds of students sending in their instrumental parts, which we then put together into orchestral um video performances mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't only one piece it was 24 of them yep 24 audio and video oh, yeah, audio and video and it's uh it uh, came out last saturday as a, a summer festival to our extravaganza extravaganza yeah but it was uh, it was fantastic actually. it, it was, was it came out so much better than um I think we or anybody or body had hoped, you know, yeah. and you know, some good performances recorded well, even though it was all done on iPhones and mm. so forth. Uh, probably 99% of them were. Um, yeah, worked on our part, and there we go. It was away. It was away. Yeah, because I mean, the, the difficulty with that project was that um, students were recording themselves at home on their phones. Yeah. By and large. And what that meant was that, you know, on one hand, you, of course, you have to sync up all the audio and all the different instrumental tracks, but because they've been recorded sort of non-professionally mm -hmm. on, you know, on, on people's phones, uh, th there was a great deal of audio mixing uh, and EQing that was necessary to actually make that sound any good. Correct. To start with, and then on top of that, um, we had to deal with the video element of that as yeah. well to yeah. put together. So, um, so it was a lot of work, but, yep. uh, but yeah, it definitely, definitely paid off. Yeah, yeah, we did a bit of a tester, didn't we, a few months ago yeah. with this as um, lockdown kicked in, and uh, I, I think we were so pleased with the results that we pushed to do what we did yeah. um, last Saturday. But yeah, so you know, it, long story short, went fantastically well, um, and it was tons of work. Very, very tired now. Taking a couple of days off hmm. and raring to get back to back to back to work. Yeah, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Well, the other thing is, of course, your mom's birthday today. It is. Happy birthday. Although it won't be when this gets shown. So happy belated birthday. <laughs> yeah. So buying presents for other people is not the easiest task. No. And I am uh, pretty poor at doing it at the best of times. <laughs> I want to buy a really good present, but I yeah. struggle to think of things. So, uh, I know that when people are trying to buy presents for me, they always find mm -hmm. it very hard because A, I pretty much have everything that I want and B, you know, the things that I am involved with are expensive. I'm so, very much the same. Ask yeah. anybody I know and they say, I've no idea what to get. Either you've got it already because yeah. you want it or I have no idea what to get you because yeah. what you do, I don't either have any interest in myself or it's, I don't, you know, it's too yeah. much to learn about. And it's very personal stuff that we do as well. Oh, completely. Yeah. And, and also, uh, I'm usually too impatient to wait. So, yeah. you know, if I really want something, I usually buy myself. Yeah. <laughs> if I haven't already got it, chances are I don't want it. Yeah, exactly. That much. Yeah. Um, or I just think it's too expensive still. That's it. Yeah. It's also, you know, I think when you're, you know, for, for a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people that I know, let's put it this way, a lot of people who are um, creatives or who are, um, you know, into photography, or uh, or video or music or something like that. They're not really into a lot of other things. It's, <laughs> it's pretty much all consuming, really. It's very, yeah, well, know? it is, isn't it? It's, so. it's it's almost a lifestyle choice, and um, you 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 do find that if you're into photography, videography, things like that, you're mm. also into music. Yeah. It seems to get they seem to go hand in hand a lot. Um, no. Not exclusively, obviously, but no. you do if you're not work at work work chances are you're doing that you know it's a very blurry line between work and enjoyment mm -hmm. for me because um you know taking photographs editing videos that's part of my work 
but I also love doing it. So yeah. there, there really is, there's an, a great distinction between, you know, the stuff that I love doing and, and doing my job. So I think it's, yeah, I mean, it's very limited. Well, that's gone slight, off on a slightly different tangent. What I've struggled with over the years is, um, whether it's audio or, or video related work, mm. is being able to price myself well because because I'm doing something I love, it's right. almost difficult to charge for that, if you know what I mean. Because yeah. it's just something you love. You say, oh, no, that's okay. You know, it's cheap. And it's taken me years and years and years to develop the, actually, no, this is worth a lot more than that mm. because of the amount of work that's involved that goes into it, the now years of experience that uh, we have behind us to do yeah. what we do. It's worth more than that. Yeah. But you, I, I've always underpriced myself. It's easy to do. Most people underprice themselves, I think, especially when they first start out. Mm. Um, and so pricing is pricing is a difficult subject for most people. Actually, for a number of reasons. First of all, people don't want to talk about money. That's, yeah. you know, um, especially in this culture, I think um, it's, it's a difficult, for most people, it's a, it's a difficult thing to talk about, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, just imagine, like, the last time a friend of you said, like, oh, I got this new job, great. When was the last time you asked him, oh, awesome, man, how much are you making? Yeah. Nobody ever asks that question, no. you know, because people are embarrassed to talk about that. And so, and I think because money seems to be that, that almost like the taboo subject that people feel uncomfortable with, at least. Um, maybe, I think when, when, when people are at that stage where they make that transition from, you know, being an amateur photographer to, to uh, becoming a professional, um, then they haven't really thought a great deal about how to price themselves. Mm -hmm. And so the typical thing that people do, in my experience anyway, is that um, they look at a competition. They kind of go like, okay, well, there's like, you know, that photographer there and he charges this much. And then there's another one that charges this much. And then you kind of try and price yourself somewhere in that, mm -hmm. in that area. Um, and intuitively, that seems to make sense because it seems to say, you know, it seems to say like, okay, this is what the market is. And you get to fit into that market somehow. Um, and then of course, you know, people sort of strategy, strategizing and think like, okay, well, if I'm new, you know, in this area, in this particular niche, you know, then I'll undercut everybody else and I get business that way and whatever, you know. Um, but I think a much more rational way of, of developing your pricing structure. This is really what I've done when I, when I first set up a photography business for myself, really. Uh, is that I looked at, I completely ignored the competition. Mm -hmm. And I basically looked at how much money do I need to make to survive, taking into account, you know, rent, utility bills, blah, 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 all, everything. And um, how many days can I possibly work realistically, right? So how many working days are there in a the year? How much holiday do I want? So. You know, I, I try to kind of create a work-life balance, um, and, and uh, I came to a realization: okay, there, there are this many days in the in the year that I can work, and how much money do I need to make, and what does that translate into as far as the daily rate is mm -hmm. concerned? Um, and that's really the starting point. And of course, you got to fact you got to factor in a little bit the fact that you know, as a photographer. Uh, you, you're most likely not going to be working five days a week. So let's say for argument's sake, you know, uh, you're realistically going to be actually shooting because that's the difference, right? Working as a photographer doesn't necessarily mean only shooting. It means shooting and then doing everything else, editing and marketing, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. prom promoting your, your business and all that kind of stuff. So that's all part, especially when you're self-employed, that's what you're going to do. So that's all time. Um, so how many shoots per week are you going to realistically do? Let's say, call it two, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then how much do you need to charge for these two shoots per week in the weeks that you're working in order to achieve the amount of income that you have to generate? And if you look at it from that perspective, that will give you a number and you know you're going to have to make that number um, because that will allow you to basically do what you're doing full time. Yeah, That's a much more rational way of looking at pricing. What you haven't done at that point is you haven't looked at the competition, you know, um, and you know, you can then basically see whether you're ballpark where you should be, you know, but every service is different. Like with one photographer, you might get 
that sort of service, you know, with another photographer, you might get a different service. It mm -hmm. just, it really depends. Um, it's the trick really is, or the magic really comes in when you're translating what you need to make and what you need to charge into value for the, for the client. Well, that's it. I think, and that's, that's what will stand you out from the competition, right? Yeah. Irrespective of price, because whether you're, you know, whatever the shit is, whether you're charging 500 pounds and someone else is charging, you know, 250 pounds for exactly the same thing. Yeah. If you can show that there is so much additional value with what you get, and whether that's simply from customer service through to yeah. added extras that you're just tacking on, whether they're actually added extras or not is a different story. Yeah. But if you're showing them as added extras, they may perceive that as additional value and that price made and go, oh, well. Yeah, value can mean a number of different things. You know, it can be, uh, you know, it can be quality or cost, but it can be, you know, speed. Yeah. You know, uh, speed of delivery. I mean, it can be all sorts of different things, flexibility, blah, blah, you know, whatever it is. Um, so, so I think, where, you know, where you have to work or where you have to put the work on is base or work in is when you look at what you need to charge and and you then try to put together um a service that creates value for the client at that point and that's mm. that's the important part mm. um rather than looking at it the other way around thinking you know i'm doing this this one thing and how much how much could i possibly charge for that i think it's looking at pricing the wrong way around yeah um you know so because if you if you think about it, wedding photographers actually do the same thing. Um, you have different packages and they include different things and they're priced differently. So, you know, typically a wedding photographer would have, I see that a lot, like three different packages. You know, you have the, the cheap option, yeah. the middle option, and then the all bells and whistles, all singing, all dancing, I throw everything at it type of expensive option. and. The psychology there is that, that a lot of people will go for the middle option, which is really where you want to get your mm -hmm. the largest proportion of your of your business from. Um, and then you've got like a, an option for some yeah you know, for a couple who maybe can't afford the middle option. And then you've got you always have people who want everything. Yeah, you know. And then and so within that range, you can basically you can then operate, but. Or you can you can find your market or your ideal client within within that range, but just imagine if you're if you as a and and, and you have to do so many shoots per year in order to make your living. But just imagine, for example, if you said, right, I'm only going to go for the high end high end market, and I'm only going to go for uh, couples that can afford to spend a lot more money on the wedding photography, mm -hmm. and instead of charging. Uh, I don't know, 1800 pounds for my top level package. I'm going to charge six grand. And, um, and the kind of client I'm, I'm going for is a completely different client at that point. Yeah. From yeah. the client that I would go for, you know, if I, if I, um, if I price something at 1200 pounds, let's say. So it's a completely different clientele. There'd be people in different types of jobs, having different types of interests, um, expecting different kind of things, you know, all the rest of whatever. Um, but of course, the advantage would be that you would you would have to find fewer clients in order to make the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. So you don't have yep. to shoot, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 weddings a year, but maybe you only have to shoot 20, but you'd make the same amount of money. Yeah. yeah. You know, and maybe the rest of the time that you're not shooting, you can then work on refining your product. You know, that's, I mean, that's kind of how, how I would look at it. Yeah. Um, but pricing is, is notoriously difficult, I think, especially in the beginning. I think once you get, once you get into it, uh, you know, once, once you've run a business for a little while, um, you get, you get to the point where you know what you're worth and you'll also, uh, you, you, you can be more confident in, in knowing exactly what you can do for mm -hmm. a set amount of, of yeah. money. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, that's sort of my view on pricing. Well, I think it's a, a, a smart way of looking at it. Um, you know, I think uh, I certainly in the, uh, you know, years and years ago when I first, first went to being self-employed, I didn't think of it like that, you know, and I fell into that Nobody ever does, yeah. trap if you like. And, sure. and it took me the longest time 
to kind of refine the way my why, way I thought about it and or almost reverse the way I thought about it as well. Yeah. But again, it's it's no surprise really because if you think about how most creatives get into becoming professionals, you know, and and actually it doesn't matter what area of, of creative um, work that is, you know, whether mm. you're a photographer or a videographer or, uh, or an editor or, um, I don't know, a sculptor, you know, I think most of the time it's basically you, you get good at what you do, um, as an artist, you know, you just get good at your craft and, and you have that, that drive to always get better. And this is, a, is another important thing, I think, yeah. cause you know, you, there's never a point where you either stop learning or you, you stand still, you just have to kind of keep on grinding and learn new things. And of course, yeah. photography is one of these things where you really never stop learning because there's always something else. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before. You know, if you're, you know, if you can't think of anything creative to do um, because you're kind of bored with what you're doing, well, you don't have to look far to find another type of photography or something sure, right. to get into. Yeah. You know, when you're used to doing that, then all of a sudden when you're confronted with having to actually run a business, then of course you may not necessarily have any of the business skills required to run a business. And and at that point, it's irrelevant whether you sell photography or whether you sell chocolate bars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a business is a business. So there's there's no there's not a lot of difference between the two. Um and just because somebody can take pretty pictures doesn't make them a good business person. And that's yeah. the that's the problem. And so what creatives have to skill up on are the business skills you know uh, the skills that, that you need to run a business yeah. that's, that's it um you know if anybody told me when i was like i don't know 15 or something if anybody told me that you know as a as a professional photographer you spend more time marketing than than actually taking pictures i would say well this, i don't yeah. want to do that i want to take pictures you know i want to film yeah. stuff that's that's the thing but the reality is of course running a business requires you to do all these things yeah, watch whatever you can about business where what read whatever you can about business but probably best way really is to talk talk to people who are in it who do it doesn't in many respects in whatever business they run yeah it doesn't have to be in the same field that you're you're going into you know like you say a business yeah. is is a business yes there are aspects around each specific business sure. that are relevant to that of course but 80 90 percent of it i'm sure is very very consistent and similar the basic accounting is the same no matter yeah, what exactly you're, right you know so talk to someone who's actually in in a, a runs their own business and you know if they're running it well then they're going to give you some good advice yeah and, and of course i mean and nowadays there's so many different courses you can do and it's this well stuff yeah, that's everywhere. True. yeah um but i mean yeah it was coming back to the pricing thing it's um i know it's i mean it's notoriously hard to know what to charge mm. um and actually you know undercharging people have a perception of value based on price so you know for instance i mean a simple example is if you said okay i'm going to take your portrait and you know i'm going to charge you 20 pounds for it um, and then somebody else comes along and basically goes like oh okay portraits with that photographer uh, cost a thousand pounds i mean immediately you haven't seen any work of either of those two but immediately you're going to think that the guy who charges a thousand pounds must be a much better photographer mm -hmm. than the person who charged 20 quid that may or may not be the case. You don't know. You just get that impression simply by looking at how much they charge. And if if the type of clientele that you're trying to attract, um, you know, let's say, you know, if, if you're trying to attract a really, um, you know, a particular clientele has a very high um, income and so on and so forth, then then undercharging like that will not it will make it very unlikely that you get that kind of client mm -hmm. you know what i mean so you need to really price yourself um right for your ideal client mm -hmm. that's the thing if you're doing family and if you're doing family portraits newborn portraits that sort of thing i think if you're if you charge a thousand pounds per photo shoot you're not going to get many clients at all it's <laughs> and the type of photos okay. you're going to produce with that are going to be completely different anyway right it really depends on um what you're doing because you can either do um, high volume low cost or you can yeah. do low volume high cost and so you just need to think about exactly what business like wh where your business sits within that these are really the two ends of the spectrum you gotta think yeah. um the more you charge the less you shoot um and the the less you charge the more you shoot yeah so yeah. for instance you know, think of a typical like high street uh, photography studios if any of those still exist 
you know. It's a couple here. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a couple down my road. Yeah. Cool. The, the, the one studio in uh, in Rickmansworth, where I live, um, shut down about a year, maybe two years ago. Oh, no way. That's a shame. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the owner moved to Cyprus, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good nice. on him. <laughs> good on him. <laughs> Not complaining. <laughs> but yeah, so... Um, yeah, so I mean, if you, if you take your typical kind of high street um, photography studio, um, that'll be uh, a high volume, low cost type of a yeah. type of a business yeah, yeah. because you know you're most likely doing family portraits, um, yeah, you know, newborn shoots, that sort of thing, and they're not going to be that expensive. And but uh, as a consequence, you have to attract a, a large number of clients to make it work. Right. Uh, if you do, if you're Annie Leibovitz. And you're doing, you know, very bespoke photo shoots um, with, you know, celebrities who are not, uh, you know, you're probably not going to be doing that many shoots per year, but they're all going to be costing you a bomb. Yeah, right. and, you know, of course. And I have no idea how much any of its charges. A couple of quid. But it's not going to be 20 pounds for this. Oh, it's not. So, right. you know, right. but that's, I mean, that's the, that's the thing. So, and of course, that's the same in any business. If you look at jewelry shops, for instance, you know, in the, in the mall or somewhere, you know, that's the same thing. You've got the low cost, you know, the low end kind of jewelry shops, and then you've got the really high end yeah. ones, and uh, they're attracting a different audience. So yeah, that's, yeah. you know, yeah. that's the thing. On the other hand, though, if you're Annie Leibovitz and, you know, you shoot bespoke imagery for celebrities, you know, to be used um, on the Vogue cover, you know, for example, then that's going to, I mean, that's the total polar opposite of that. It's going to be extremely expensive. I have no idea how much any of its charges, but it's not going to be 20 quid. Or something 25, maybe. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Under 100. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, so that's a, that's a different thing. But then any of is not going to shoot as many clients in a year. Talking about any of its, by the way, it's a little bit of a controversial situation a little bit of controversy happening there okay did you hear about that it's always fun no so she shot the um the vogue august front cover mm -hmm. and so she shot um the athlete simone biles uh american yes okay so, so that cover really caused a bit of a, a bit of a twitter onslaught because apparently Ugh, of course on twitter where yeah, else well exactly yeah. so so a lot of people um, didn't really agree with her uh, lighting style on this and basically call it, uh, un you know, underexposed and too dark. And um, and so this, so I think the general consensus was that she wasn't very capable of um, photographing black skin tones. That's ridiculous. I mean, it's hard to believe, really, that somebody <laughs> like Annie Leibovitz would, would not be... I mean, it's just, it seems nonsensical. I think it was a stylistic choice um, because if you think about her kind of portraiture, it, you know, the, it's always very subdued when it comes to colors. It's always very painterly, you know, that sort of thing. And I mean, I've, I've saw the uh, the two images in question actually for the book cover and um, they're, they're totally, in my opinion, they're fully in keeping with uh, with her style. Okay. I mean, my in my view, it's really not a matter of, um, of, of, any lip of it's being incapable of photographing dark skin tones. It's just, it seems, that seems complete nonsense to me. I'm willing to bet that had this cover been shot a year ago, um, this wouldn't have even been raised as an issue. No, that's you true. Know, and it's, I appreciate that, yeah. you know, there's sensitivity around um, with the Black Lives Matter movement and and, sure. and and things like that going on at the moment. I'm, you know, fully support all of that, but mm. the, that then brings about just a heightened sensitivity around things that might might be perceived as issues, but yeah. perhaps wouldn't have been perceived as issues previously. No, probably not. I mean, it, the thing is, um, Volk had, had announced um, like a month ago or something that they were actively going to look to um, diversify more. Mm -hmm. And that's just nothing wrong with that. That's, that's exactly the right thing yeah. to do, I think. And that's the, the point of the meme, right? It's to open yeah. people's eyes a bit more as to what these issues really are, yeah. you know? Because people aren't aren't seeing it. I haven't yeah. been seeing it. And so of course, you know, I mean, Volk, apparently, um, apparently 
Vogue have never had a black photographer shoot the front cover. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Well, it's hard to believe, but but maybe if you think about how many Vogue covers Annie Leibovitz has shot for them yeah. in her career, I, I don't know how many, but a lot, right? Um, it just means that, you know, and Vogue comes out once a month, some of them. I don't know. I mean, you're, you're yeah. the fashion theory oh, around yes, here. Yes, of course. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, so, but what I'm, what I'm saying is there aren't really that many covers to be shot. Yeah. You know, and um, as a magazine, you work with, with you know, photographers, with the same photographers, you know, over a long period of time. So yeah. there aren't really that many opportunities. Of course. Um, it's a bit like, you know, I spoke to a friend of mine not too long ago and he's... Um, He's a full-time photographer, but in his day job, he works as a CSI photographer. So he works with police and photographs crime The scenes. pop group. <laughs> yeah, the police. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's a, he works for the Metropolitan Police and he um, photographs crime scenes. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, really. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but that must be quite a job. I'm sure it is. I mean, wow. absolutely, yeah. But um, but the interesting thing was that you know, we had a conversation one time and um, you were talking about how how he got into this into this job and, and the thing is like he said like well there are virtually no job openings in this because um, a there's a very limited number of police photographers sure you know um, but also those is so specialist that those people who retire they usually tend to stay on so even when somebody retires out of this small group of people. There isn't necessarily then a job opening because the the people who've just retired kind of stay on because they are the ones with the most expertise. And I can see the logic in that because yeah. of course clearly you want to have the best people doing that job. Yeah. But basically what that means is like there isn't going to be a great deal of turnover when it comes to these mm. these kind of jobs. And I think you know the same thing is pretty much true when you look at um, a magazine like Vogue because they have a particular style. Well, so this is what I was going to say, right? Is mm. they do have a very, very particular style, and the style that are going for on next month's cover, you're going to choose the best photographer for that job, mm. right? And they, I'm sure, positive that that's all they've ever done. Is this is the style we want? Yeah. This is the best photographer to take that style. Yeah. We want that person exactly. And you know, I. I fully, I fully applaud the uh, the sentiment of um, you know uh, of creating more diversity. Um, they were also talking about um, it being more inclusive as as far as uh, black models are concerned. Mm -hmm. Completely get that. It's just in this particular case, I I just feel that you know that criticism of Annie Leibovitz's ability to to light. Um, dark skin i think that's really missing the point i think it's, it completely is, it's yeah. my it's my view um you know again i, I absolutely 100 percent believe that that's totally a stylistic choice uh people don't like it it's art i mean yeah. you like it or you don't like it, it's perfectly fine you i think you can criticize it for what it is but i'm thinking you know it's just my sense is just to politicize it like that i just don't feel that's the right thing to do in this particular case because sure. i kind of I just you know i haven't seen the images myself yet. yeah um but as soon as we're done i, I will be having a look at those and I, I i from what you've described about it absolutely agree yeah i mean it's, it's one of these things you know i think when you look at um, interestingly enough I, I um i read a book at christmas um about uh, about annie Leibovitz, and you look at you know her career and the images that she's created i mean there are some incredibly stunning images in there mm. no doubt mm. you know it's the photography um at a level of skill that the vast majority of photographers can only aspire to mm -hmm. you know but there are some corkers in there i mean there are some images in there where you are like mm, mm. i don't like that one you know and that's cool because nobody cares whether I like it or not. By the yeah. way, it's, it's the other thing, you know. But so, but ultimately, this is this is what art is all about. You know, it's the same with music. You know, you like one type of music, one song, and so, not another. Do you like every single song your favorite band has ever done? No, absolutely no, probably not. not. Right? So. Sure. I'm I'm listening to some Alison Chains at the moment, and there's a whole bunch of tracks I don't listen to because I don't like them. There's a whole bunch of I'm Alison Chains fan as well, and yeah. there's a whole bunch of that. Like exactly, yeah. So, you know, um, I just. 
yeah, I mean, that's, that's just the thing that kind of um, uh, stood out for me. That just, it just doesn't make any sense. And I, d I don't buy the argument that we're talking about somebody here who's incapable of... of uh, I mean, I, I want to know how many black people has she shot in her career? That's probably, most likely, wasn't the first one. So to say that, you know, somebody with that standing has no experience, is just seems it's crazy. It seems bonkers. So it's crazy. that's just, um, you know, agree with that or don't. Um, but have a look at the images yourself. Um, you know, you may like the style or not. That's all cool. But um, like I said, you know. Did, I, did you like the images? I did actually like them. And I, again, because um, because I'm I, I really, and I'm not a fanboy or anything, but I really, I do love uh, Annie Leibovitz's mm -hmm. uh, kind of portrait style. Um, and I can, and, and so as a consequence, I've seen a lot of her, a lot of her images, you know. Um, and I have to say, I mean, for me, they absolutely fall within her um, photographic style. It's not, okay. they're not unusual for me, you know. I mean, to the point where I would look at them and I, I would say like, oh, yeah, that looks like Leibovitz image, mm. you know. Mm. So... Um, but again, I'm not saying that everybody has to love that style, you know, and that's why there's, that's why, I mean, if you look at other portrait photographers, um, they have completely different styles, like Platon, for example, or I mean, this whole, whole you know, whole range of people, um, Zacharias, whatever, you look at different photographers and just like you look at, you know, you listen to different uh, albums or different artists and you like one album, you don't like another. It's the same here, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately. So anyway, so, uh, you know, not flying the flag for any little bit, but I am kind of, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> anyway, had to be said. Cool. So is there anything interesting you came across? Um, there were tons of tech camera related things knocking about this mm. week, but the trying to steer clear of tech, so I seem to gear towards that all the time. After you talked about uh, John Malkovich, last week mm -hmm. i came across this other story where i'm gonna look up his name so i get it right where a photographer called drew gardner has gone about recreating old paintings okay but as, as a photo oh yeah so he's, he's taking photos of you know he's, he's looked at the mona lisa for example and he's done recreated a photo version of it He's used, you know, try to use exactly the same kind of lighting um, that's mm -hmm. kind of appears in the painting. Um, the set design as almost spot for spot perfect. Okay, cool. Um, clothing, all things like that. And he's really gone to town on it. Now, the little added twist to it is that every single person that models in these photos oh. are descendants of the people in the painting. <laughs> really? So wow. we've got the descendant yeah. of... Um, Lisa in uh, the main of Lisa. Yeah. Uh, I could go through and pronounce the names, but I won't. I'll let you go look those up. Yeah. Uh, Napoleon, descendant of Napoleon doing it as well. Wow, really? Um, uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel too is another one that's in there. Sure. Clive of India. And wow. so, and, and this goes on. This whole uh, Dickens as well. And he's done such a cracking job. I mean, really, really good. I mean, clearly they're never going to look the same. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a photo at the end of the day and it's just, never going to be a painting hmm. but it's a very cool little project project that he's gone how, for how do you track these people down i don't like, know it's I, I, that's yeah. a great question i mean to work that lineage i mean when was the main lisa painted 100 well a few hundred years ago right yeah five for, i don't know if that's ago. incorrect we're <laughs> going to delete this bit <laughs> and go <laughs> back <laughs> and that... so the mona lisa was uh painted 400 years ago so the Mona Lisa was painted 300 years ago. <laughs> so the Mona Lisa was painted 500 years ago. <laughs> we just use whatever. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the lineage has been tracked, I guess, given that these are very, you know, most of these people are obviously very, yeah. very, very famous people. Um, so I guess they know who they are, but to get those people involved and for them to actually model for this is yeah. something else. Would have been cool if he dug up the original skeleton of the Mona oh, Lisa. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that because I started watching Dracula last night. Of course, yeah. <laughs> I knew there'd be a reason. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. The, the, uh, check it out, man. Yeah, have, have a look at them. Have a look at them. Mm. And, um, you know, it could just give you a few ideas of, of projects that, you know, we could do. And you know, perhaps one of our, uh, speaking of which, our photo competition, uh, 
our photo challenge, sorry, mm. we need to um, talk about at some point today. Yeah. But perhaps that's another one of our photo challenge challenges um, later on in the year. Recreate an existing photo or painting in our own style. Yeah. There was an interesting uh, project a few years ago where um, a an open mic night, uh, where, where I used to live, um, this particular open mic night has been going for like, I don't know, 10 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's like on a weekly basis and it's packed all the time. So it's, it's usually hugely successful. Um, thanks to not, not only the, uh, you know, the very varied music scene in that in a part of the country, but also uh, you know the people that run it are really devoted and dedicated to it. Mm -hmm. um, but a few years ago, uh, they did this. They created this um, fundraiser calendar, and it was basically twelve famous uh, album covers recreated with local musicians as models, um, nude. <laughs> 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 yeah, so it's like a nude calendar. Um, and, uh, and yeah, they, they basically styled, you know, set like whatever album cover, like Pink Floyd or whatever it was. I can't, I can't actually remember what, um, but yeah, it was, it's like, you know, 12 different albums. Um, I, but I, what I do remember was that the end results were phenomenal. Mm. They're really amazing. Some yes. of them were really damn close, you know? So, um, this is a fun thing to do. Absolutely. I was talking, yeah. um, talking to my fr friend of mine, not a couple of weeks ago now about you know just saying that i'd really like to record you know a beatles track but record it using the techniques that they would have used back in the in the 60s recorders you know yeah exactly <laughs> exactly Did you, have you ever have you ever heard the shitty flute player no, no? you don't know shitty flute no oh my no God. it's basically this dude um on youtube who uh if you haven't heard it check it out he basically takes famous tunes um, like hit songs, like, I don't know, Britney Spears or the Star mm -hmm. Wars team, whatever. And he records them as an instrumental flute piece played totally out of tune and out of time. And it's, uh, it's <laughs> the greatest, greatest entertainment of the highest quality oh, you can possibly love imagine. Love it. So yeah, it's, uh, it's something to behold. Oh, I'll check that out for yeah. sure. For sure. Shitty flute. It's going to be done. But we, we were... Um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, thinking about recording it in the way that the, the Beatles would have recorded it back then. But if we were to choose a song of Sgt. Pepper's, we'd go ahead and do our own version of the album cover as well with just us in it. Yeah. And just do oh, yeah, all yeah. the multiple people, all different instruments and whatnot. Yeah. And see what we could come up with. That would be challenging, but fun. Uh, yeah. How would you do that, though? I mean, technology wise, because a lot of that kind of technology isn't really available anymore, is it? To record? Yeah. Um, no. Well, yeah, it's hard to get hold of um, and very, very expensive. Because I'm guessing like the kind of, of, the kind of but, desks or something. Yeah, I, I mean, I've got, you know, analog modeling plugins okay. that model that sp those specific oh, okay. um, sort of units that you used mm. back then. Um, and then if you combine that with, you know, renting a few old mics and using yeah. the techniques that they would have used to mic the particular instruments, yeah. Um, you know, recreate guitar sounds and the bass sounds in the way that they would have would have done it. It's yeah. all going to have a slight modern edge to it. It just mm. there's no really no way around that. But I guess anyway, just just to, uh, the sheer fact that you'd be recording digitally rather than on tape, uh, that would would that that would make a difference, wouldn't it? It does make a difference, so. and there are tape modeling plugins out there, and mm. you know there are other things that you can do by knocking off the top end and that kind of stuff. But and it gets you somewhere close. Yeah. There's never quite the same so it's like a modern retro reimagination of the original recording kind of yeah. yeah but get trying to get with with a view to trying to get it as close as possible to the original yeah um for a pure you know it's almost an academic exercise in how to record yeah. like you would have done in the 60s yeah, yeah that, that'd be interesting yeah Hmm. Whether we get around to it or not, I don't know. Yeah, we should think about recreating some photographs or something. In a, yeah, we could, rec we could see we could recreate album covers. That's a good idea. <laughs> Join our two worlds that we're involved in. Ah, hmm, interesting thought. Interesting thought. Cool. So talking about challenge, of course, um, we've got another photo challenge happening. This yes, 
uh, which is landscape photography. Mm -hmm. So uh, just as a bit of a recap, last month we had a uh, pets and animals kind of challenge. This year, uh, this year, I don't where is that. I was thinking I this. <laughs> yeah. So this month it's um, it's a landscape challenge. So if you have or if if you've taken any awesome landscape photos, or you've got some great shots uh, that you want to share with us, then please send them in. You can send them in uh, e either by email to um, cameraShakePodcast at gmail.com or you can uh, send us photos via uh, Facebook, for example, facebook.com forward slash camera shake podcast. Um, yeah. Or tie them to the collar of your dog and send your dog around. Whatever works for you. Anything like that. Every single week. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> I got a dog. I'm a dog parent now. Oh, That's yes, a, you are. I'm, yes, you are. I'm a dog and a, and a cat parent, you know. <laughs> It's like it's it's like any other household with with two kids. They always fight. They don't get on. Constantly arguing, you know. Man, <laughs> man. Nobody ever wins. It's the other True. thing. True. So yeah, um, yeah. So anyway, in any event, if you have any photos um, that you want to uh, throw into the challenge, then um, please send them over. And of course, we'll be talking to the winner of this month's challenge um, in next month's podcast. Okay, so here's the thing I came across. Um, interesting tech news. So this time it's, it's this week it's down to me to bring the tech news, I suppose. I like tech. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So um, there are two new camera announcements mm -hmm. um, that uh, that should be quite interesting. Actually, three camera announcements. We come to the third one at the I end. I did say there were a lot. Didn't yeah, I? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> also, it's a very really tech heavy week. I thought um, it's very light on the kind of fun stories mm. and. Um, and yeah, really heavy on the, on the tech, I thought. So, so the first the first camera I want to talk about uh, really briefly is the the uh, Nikon Z5 or Z5. Yep. Yeah. So that's been announced. I mean, it was kind of um, rumored a little while ago, but uh, Nikon have come out, I think, with with a few more um, sort of details on that. So um, they're going to bring out the the Z5, uh, which is sort of an entry level mirrorless camera. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, of course we've, we already have the, uh, the the Z6 and the Z7, but the Z5 is basically uh, kind of more at this sort of entry level, kind of you know sort of ent entry level segment. Um, but there's some really interesting little uh, things about that camera. Uh -huh. One is right off the bat, it's got two SD card slots. Good. So oh. dual card slots. Um, if you remember. Nikon was slated just as uh, just as Canon was when they first came out with their first uh, you know set of of mirrorless cameras, uh, for only having one um, card slot. Yeah, and uh, so obviously they've listened to the criticism and they've rectified that, um, and that now comes with with uh, two card slots. Um, it's a twenty four point three megapixel CMOS full frame sensor, so it's not a DX camera, so it's not crop. You know, crop sensor. It's a full frame sensor, so that's okay. Cool. Um, it also has five axis in body stabilization. Okay. So immediately, if you are thinking of doing video as well, that's good news. Um, and uh, and it also has the same autofocus system as the Z6. Mm -hmm. So that's also good news, really, because actually, that autofocus system that works really well. Um, I've had a chance to try that out myself. Um, not too long ago, and actually, I was quite happy with that. Um, you know, so uh, it's the same. I think it's two hundred and seventy something um, focus points yep. know, through. So that's uh, that sounds okay. Um, it has eye detect for humans and animals. So you know, cats and dogs. That might be. I might go into uh, dog photography. <laughs> um, it, it shoots 4.5 frames per second, continuous speed. That doesn't sound very high. Um, it's, it's obviously, I mean, it's not really a camera for like sports photographers, you know, or wildlife photographers, I would, would have thought. Um, so uh, that kind of, that speed is, I don't think it's really going to be playing that much of, of an important mm -hmm. role in this, in this particular mm -hmm. camera. Okay. Um, but it does come most likely with 4K video. And actually that's really good news. It would make sense if it's got um, in-body stabilization as well. That's great. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So how does 
how does the five compare to the six and the seven? What, what, why is the five different compared to the six and the seven? It's, it has two dual SD card slots. So that's the, <laughs> yeah, thing, yeah. that's the well, the Z six. Um, actually, in terms of video, of course, and they've gone, they've gone the whole hog there, and you can, like, it's almost like full like raw recording with an external recording yeah. stuff. I don't think the Z the Z five goes that far. Um, uh, so it's. And I, I didn't have, I didn't get any indication as to what the price point is. So, I mean, I would guess that because it's an entry level camera, it will basically be obviously it'll be cheaper than the than yeah. the Z six. But the other thing to to bear in mind also is that there are rumors, and I think they're really only rumors at the moment, is that Nikon are planning to bring out sort of an upgraded version of the Z six and the Z seven, really? which is rumored to be called um, Z six S and uh, Z seven S. Okay. Um, so what that kind of means is, I think um, that it's not a, a brand new model. It's going to be more like an enhanced version of the already existing okay. Z6. And one of the rumors that I've heard over the last week is that the Z6s and the Z7s are supposed to to have two card slots as well. <laughs> so you know, whatever. I mean, basically, that's it's only rumors at this point. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, I think, I mean, price point wise, like I said, there hasn't been really any talk about that, but um, it's going to obviously sit below the um, b- below the Z6. So probably, I don't know, maybe 900 pounds somewhere okay. in that segment, maybe, or thought maybe maximum, I don't know, something well, like you, that. You- if it is going to be in that kind of pro- that kind of price point, that's you're getting a pretty damn good camera for, for Can't really relatively little money. Yeah, you know, it's got a lot of similar features to the six and seven right you know it's... well and if you compare like only if you just look at the the video capability yeah i mean also the fact that it's full full frame by the way that's you know that's, that's, absolutely that's good but um if you just look at the the video capability and compare that let's say to the d750 for example i mean it's you know there's this no comparison actually yeah. so you get a much better camera really for you know less money yeah um so, you know, I mean, it sounds, that sounds good to me. Um, obviously, Nikon brought the, the D780, which is that kind of hybrid camera, which is sort of sometimes uh, a DSLR, sometimes mirrorless, depending on what it is that you do with it and blah, blah, and this, you know. And by all accounts, again, I've spoken to a couple of people who, who own one and they're very happy with it. It's cool. I think with this one here, though, this is like going entry level in the mirrorless yeah. segment. So, um, so yeah, it sounds, it sounds not too bad. So now that we're talking about cameras, um, the other big announcement was the Sony a7 three mm. or a7 S three. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the new Sony a7 S three, um, comes out on July the 28th. Okay. So not too, not too far to go. Um, now I'm going to, Give you an idea as to what the specs are, and you tell me which segment you think this camera is, is aimed okay. at. The A7S III comes with 12 megapixel fast readout. Um, it's likely a stacked CMOS sensor. Mm-hmm. Um, it's 16 bit raw output on mm-hmm. the video side, a uh, 15 stop dynamic range, and that's allegedly, you know, so it's not 100%, but that's what I'm saying. It can shoot 1080 at 240 frames per second, right? right. So that's super smooth, super slow mo. Battery. Well, yeah, that's that. Um, but it does 4K 120 frames per second. Oh, so nice, nice. Um, but here's the thing. So you remember last time we spoke about. Canon's R5. Yeah, yeah. And um, of course, since then, this, there's been some reports that there's been some overheating going on. And there was, uh, do you remember, uh, it's 8K, but you can downsample it to 4K, whatever. Um, the problem there was, one, one of the things with that R5 is that your recording limit is going to be quite drastic depending on how high your resolution is. So if you're shooting in 8K, you probably want to get it few minutes of actual recording time. Um, and that's kind of, that's annoyed a lot of video shooters because, um, 
because it's really you know you really want to be able to record for a long time ideally and if 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 you've got a camera capable of recording 8k yeah well, there should be no like that well i mean the, the problem has to do with uh, the heat generation yeah yeah you know yeah. so in like in cine cameras for example you have you know just like air yeah circulation yeah. whatever ventilation building and whatever and you can do that because you got bigger bodies um with a cam- with a camera like the r5 or any relatively small size camera like that you, you can't really do that so um so then your camera will generate heat and you're gonna have to find a way to get rid of that heat or shut down so that he can yeah dissipate it and you know um and cool down so so that was one of the major criticisms and canon have released a few statements as to why that would be and why it's not as bad as people think and all that kind of jazz but there seems to be at this point it seems as though there might be a lot of heat um but the sony as uh, a7s3 apparently has no recording limit that's good so that's so, so it's a camera for videographers. Completely. <laughs> no question. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> also has a fully articulated screen. So it means, you know, if you're if you're vlogging or something, it's a perfect camera. Mm-hmm. You know, the A7 III was aimed at videographers. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, so this is, you know, it's an enhanced version of that. But if you look at the specs, actually, this sounds pretty damn serious, you know? Yeah. Good camera. Um, 12 megapixel. The whole thing about a stacked CMOS sensors, the way I understand this is that that gives you a higher resolution. Um, But uh, so, although 12 megapixels initially kind of sounds like, you know, that sounds pretty low. No, I've only got 10 in my GH5S. Well, do you remember we were talking about the R6 and it was like, you know, 20, whatever it was, 20 megapixels or something. And uh, I was thinking like, why would you bring out a camera like that? You know, now this seems worrying nothing i mean again from having spoken to people over the last couple of weeks or something it's everybody's got the same worries you you can go 20 really Mm, not sure um but if you're aiming at videographers in particular then that doesn't necessarily really matter no it doesn't so it doesn't yeah so yeah um so those are two main announcements um that sort of stuck out for me. So the, the Nikon um, Z5 and the Sony A7S3. But there's one more camera announcement. Okay. Pentax. Oh, oh, I heard little bits and pieces about this. Yeah. Yeah, go on. Everybody knows somebody who shoots Pentax, right? Mm-hmm. Same with Olympus. Um, So Olympus's imaging section was sold off a couple of weeks ago. And of course, there was, uh, you know, was, there's a lot of um, concern amongst Olympus shooters as to what's, what was going to happen to um, future cameras and lenses and support for existing models and all the rest of it. And Olympus have been quick to basically reassure mm-hmm. their clientele, their audience, uh, to say that, um, you know, setting setting the uh, imaging section off doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to disappear from the market. You know, um, so they're trying to be very reassuring. And I think, you know, if you've invested a lot of money into a particular brand, you know, into glass and camera bodies over time, then I think when you, when you, when you hear that kind of news, then you get, you know, you're immediately going to get worried. And I'm pretty sure that there might be some people jumping ship, you know, um, and the question is always, where do they, where do they jump to, you know, Fuji? could be, um, or Pentax, but Pentax have just announced that they have no interest in joining the mirrorless market whatsoever. Um, oh God, they're going to be HD DVD, aren't they? <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, no. so, I mean, initially I kind of thought, man, that's crazy, mm. you know, because they're basically, you know, they're basically waving the flag for DSLR technology. Fair enough. Um, and. I watched their announcement and, and, you know, what they were saying was along the lines of um, there is not, there's nothing better than um, looking at a true picture of your image through an optical viewfinder. And I mean, I, I don't know. It sounds like fluff to me. It's, I mean, you know, you know this thing where um, when new technology comes out, there's always going to be this niche, like this niche market segment 
where people would just um, insist on using old technology. Yeah. Like for instance, yeah. you know, you can say like when, when CDs came out, there were people who would insist um, to listen to vinyls. Yeah. Right. And and even nowadays there are people who prefer vinyls, which yeah. is all cool, you know, for all the right reasons. But um, so it seems to me like Pentax are sort of carving themselves out, you know, to be that company that in a world of mirrorless cameras will remain true to um, to DSLR technology. And they're sort of finding reasons as to why that's a good idea. That's just what it sounded like to me. You know? And and that's that's what I, I think I'm, I have I take issue with is they're finding that they, they're, they're announcing reasons for it, which are not reasons. I, I, for, for me, you know, it's just fluff. Hmm. Just say, you know, we don't want to make mirrorless cameras. We want to be the, hmm. the number one DSLR for the future. Yeah. That's cool. Stick with it. You should stick with it. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, the thing is, I am, you know, if you think about what um, coming, you know, what, what changing to mirrorless technology, what that means is, you know, first of all, you're going to have to come up with a different lens mount. Yeah. You know, that's an absolute necessity. Yeah. Um, because you now the distance between mm -hmm. the lens and the, the sensor is, is shorter. Um, so you're going to have to create a different mount. And virtually all camera manufacturers have um, take, you know, used that as an opportunity to come up with bigger lens mounts. So for instance, the Z mount with Nikon is considerably bigger than the, the original F mount. And um, there are advantages to that because you can now create lenses that will um allow you to to shoot at lower f stops mm -hmm. or wider aperture openings and mm -hmm. what i mean is you can you can create images that are well the lens will let in more light mm -hmm. uh, for one but also it will allow you to uh, to shoot at a much narrower depth of field so for some type of portrait photography it might be uh sure it might be uh, it might be interesting um but and of course changing your uh, changing your camera mount or your lens mount means that all of a sudden all lenses produced up to that point will be incompatible unless you have an adapter, right? Like, for instance, like Nikon and Canon mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. have an adapter that you can use. Um, and of course, uh, as far as the production of new lenses is concerned, they will sort of move on to the new mount and then that'll be it and eventually. The same thing happens, of course, periodically. Um, same thing happens, I think, in the 80s with with the Nikon mount, I think the F, F mount has been around since then, um, and whatever the mount was, I forget what the mount was called before that, but and this, there's a need sometimes to change over, and that's all cool. But Pentax have obviously decided that they don't want to play along, and so they're just going to stick to uh, stick to their existing mount, and uh, and it'll support their existing lenses and carry on. It feels like they're making the assumption that Nikon and Canon will completely cease to make DSLRs in the future. That might be true, but that's a gamble right now. Because if they don't, and um, well, I mean, my view is that manufacturers can't really afford to switch entirely mm -hmm. to um, to mirrorless until they're at a point where they've virtually replaced their entire assortment of of lenses. Sure, sure. Um, to the new mount. So, for instance, uh, take Canon and Nikon as an example. Now, one of the advantages of uh, both Canon and Nikon compared to other uh, camera manufacturers is the fact that they've got such a long-standing tradition of um, of of lenses. Yeah. So they just have yeah. a huge assortment of lenses. And that's what that means is that depending on what kind of photography you do, there's always going to be the right lens for you. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, they're making, I don't even know how many different models of, of lenses at all sorts of different focal lengths and different combinations and this and any other. So, I mean, for instance, take uh, Nikon Z5 that we talked about a second ago. They at the same time they're coming out with a new kit lens, which is a twenty-four to fifty-two or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's an f four to six point three. It's a variable aperture kind of lens, a kit lens, mm -hmm. cheap and cheerful. It'll do. Get anyone started things. though? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Kit yeah. lens for it, particularly if Z5 is a um, going to be kind of that entry level. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Completely. Um, but that's, of course, you know, that's going to be a Z-mount lens. So, you know, no need for an adapter, no need for, mm -hmm. you know, anything like that. So, um, and of course, new lenses will um, take advantage of new technologies and, you know, stabilization. The interesting thing I, I learned also about um, image stabilization, by the way, and this is something I really didn't, I wasn't aware of before, um, is that apparently 
um, in-body stabilization uh, is beneficial for wider lenses. Mm. Um, it will stabilize. Mm. It, will, it will yield a better result at, at wider, uh, wider lenses. So, for instance, um, if you're a vlogger, for example, most vloggers uh, or influencers, whatever, um, use relatively wide lenses. I mean, nobody's going to vlog. I heard this as a comment I'm ripping off, but um, you know, nobody's really going to uh, vlog on a seventy to two hundred. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. How how would you going to do that? Oh, yeah, get your eyeball in. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so, uh, so in body stabilization work well with um, with wider lenses, whilst in lens stabilization favors longer lenses. Mm. And I didn't mm. know that, um, mm. but that basically uh, that would be why um, some manufacturers are focusing on both of these technologies. So take Canon and Nikon, for example. Um, they're bringing out lenses with with in lens stabilization, but at the same time they're also focusing a lot of energy on um, on in body stabilization. Yeah. So if you have the ability to do both, then you're really catering for a much wider variety of photographers. Yeah. You know, because depending on what it is, like if you're a wildlife photographer, you're not going to use wide lenses most for the most part. Coming back to Pentax. Yes. Um, I just found that that was a, you know, that was that was an interesting uh, bit of news. I read a few thoughts about that, and, and uh, some people seem to uh, really agree with with Pantax really focusing on that, you know, that niche kind of segment. Um, I just, I don't know. I have a difficult time with that. Really. Well, so you know, because uh, I don't have a huge market share now, anyway, right? In in comparison, um, no, and that was one of the arguments, actually. Yeah, you know, and so they're they're relatively small. You know, these days, if Nikon and Canon do move to exclusively to mirrorless, mm. the chances are that if you're already a Nikon shooter, yeah. you're going to gravitate towards the mirrorless camera, right? True. I can't imagine that many people will go completely change company at that point, go totally different brand and go, oh, no, I'm going to go Pentax now because they're going to continue to make DSLRs. Mm. Yeah, it could be ten years before Nikon stopped DSLRs. It could be longer. Yeah, if they even do, I, I'm. I, I perhaps perhaps it will work out for them. I just feel they're making that announcement just a little too soon. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there, there there is a school of thought that basically says like, um, you know, because they've got such a small uh, market share, they're not really competing with Canon and Nikon or Sony, they're mm-hmm. the big three. Um, that therefore. The amount of energy and money that it would have to put into developing a mirrorless system, you know, would would bring them no actual commercial advantage. Sure, sure, um, sure. And I can kind of see that point. I just yeah. don't think that's necessarily future proof to rely on old technology. Um, you know, uh, you know what I mean. I mean, it's, it's a bit like, um, yeah, it's it's really like, like vinyl so, or even CDs. I mean, who buys CDs these days? No, oh, quite. Yeah, you know, quite. nobody really buys buys CDs anymore. So if you entirely relying on selling CDs, you're not really going to be no. in business for very long. Do you know what no. I mean? I mean it's, it's just like, it's one of these weird things. Um, it'd be interesting to see how that works out for them. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult one. It's a, maybe there's a other thought processes behind what they're mm. doing, but it's difficult to see. Yeah. I mean, there are specialist kind of segments in photography generally. I mean, film photography yeah. might be one of those. Yeah. Um, and... You know, film photography, like like we discovered the other day, is um, is getting really quite expensive. You know, so it's it's an expensive, it's much more expensive than digital photography because because mm-hmm. now film is more expensive and getting it developed is more expensive than it used to be, um, and so it's a very specialist kind of yeah subject. Yeah. You know, um, which is also very pricey. So there was there was one one thought that. Uh, that suggested that Pentax may want to look at entirely focusing on film photography. Mm. I know. It's an interesting thought. Yeah. I get there's a... I'm just oh, not sure. Know. Yeah, I'm just not sure whether that's the volume for, for that. You know, well, so. here's another question for you then. How much further can DSLRs go? There's a reason mirrorless has come out. Yeah. And the reason that, that, that that's being seen by the major companies as the future. At least the... Um, yeah, the near term, medium term future. Yeah. But can DSLRs themselves just go 
Any further? Well, so I mean, here's the thing. Do you remember when we started this episode when we were talking about pricing and we were talking about finding your ideal client and actually marketing to that client um, and providing the services that that particular client yeah. wants, right? Um, there's something to be said for different types of photographers. Like, for instance, if you think like rangefinder cameras, for example, um, you know, when DSLRs first came out, there was there was controversy there. Um, I'm just thinking of the way I view my Fuji X100F, which is a rangefinder camera. Um, it has a, a fixed lens, fixed focal mm -hmm. length. Um, so there's no zoom or anything. Um, and it's, you can't change the lenses or whatever. And the argument there is kind of similar, you know, whereby initially you kind of think, yeah, but why, why would you, why would you even buy a camera that you can't zoom in on and we can't change, change lenses. That's like, so totally unprofessional, but there's a reason why I love that camera. You know, I love it because of the limitations that it mm -hmm. has. And, and that's what I bought it and it wasn't cheap. So, and I'm not the only person who's ever bought a Fuji X100. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so there's, yeah. there's, there's a, there's definitely a market for that. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering whether there is that DSLR market, but I'm also feeling that it's too early to tell because Okay. Mirrorless hasn't really been around for that long. No. And although it seems like it's it totally is the future and we're all headed that way, um who knows what's gonna be hip and trendy in five years' time. Yep. I mean, CDs are certainly not hip and trendy right now. I've seen a lot of um CDs on, on fruit trees at my, my in laws <sighs> CDs allotment. will not come back. <laughs> There's no benefits to them coming back in any way. No, exactly. You know, it's digital digital media. Yeah. Whereas, you know, listen to it on Spotify, streaming it, or whatever download you got, it's, yeah. it's the same file. It's identical in every exactly. way. You can listen to it through the same system. Vinyl is totally different. I agree. There's, there's not much of an advantage um, to that. I mean, unless you're such a niche yeah. shooter, you know, that's, yeah. yeah. It's kind of, it's a, yeah, I don't know. It's just yeah. one of these weird announcements i've given I've an opinion but i i'm basically i am actually withholding opinion on it until see how it plays out you know they've, yeah. they've got a thought process behind it and i hope they succeed the last thing i wanted to, to see is pentax go down in five ten years oh, 20 sure. years or whatever so they that's not going to do anybody any good no no it's yeah. not they oh god how long have they been around Can, since, yeah, it's, since the, it is the same with same with Olympus. You know, nobody nobody benefits when um, the playing field becomes smaller. No, absolutely. You know, um, you know I, I do I do honestly believe that competition is necessary to drive things forward. Yep. You know, otherwise there'd be no reason. Mm -hmm. um, when Sony first came on the scene as a major player, um, that really gave the you know the big two at the time, Nikon and Canon, you know, kick up the butt really yeah and it's it's really led to much better cameras it's, it's really i think it's accelerated especially the video uh components yeah. the capabilities of uh of dslrs absolutely and uh, and mirrorless and then of course mirrorless technology in itself um if it hadn't been for sony then you know canon and nikon would probably still be yeah making dslrs I mean, yeah, they, they when you've originally. only got two major companies like that they both know what each other's doing yeah and they release things at a slower pace to eke out. It's it's a if you were them, that's exactly what you would do. Yeah. You know, you you will ultimately make more money that way. But as soon as you got someone else coming into the game, and then Panasonic coming up to coming up the rear with the on the video side anyway, mm. they've got to move forward to yeah. keep their share. And I mean, it was a smart move at the time. I thought, I thought you know, Sony didn't even want to compete with Nikon and Canon because there was no point. They just yeah. basically went, well, we're going yeah. to do something completely different. Here's what we're doing. And uh, and of course, it caught on, you yeah. know, because the advantages are immediately clear, which is why I still don't understand why. For, for instance, like in this um, in this Pentax announcement, one of the um, in, in one of the segments, it talked about the viewfinder and the fact that, you know, it's uh, DSLRs use a pentaprism and uh, you can see the light directly and it's a fully optical mm -hmm. viewfinder type of system as opposed to EVFs, like you know, electronic viewfinders. Mm -hmm. um, and electronic viewfinders, basically what you're looking at is a mini screen inside of the camera. And then, of course, it, uh, it comes down to resolution. So the higher the resolution, the better the image, technically speaking. Sure. Um, and I think when 
you know, originally when uh, mirrorless cameras first came out, there was an argument to say that EVFs with all the advantages that they would bring, like you can see the image as the camera sees it, like, you know, before you press the shutter button, there's no guessing. Uh, you don't have to rely on um, meters, or, you know, light meters or whatever else. You can basically see what you're taking. And when you press the shutter button, that is exactly the image um, that you're recording. And what an advantage that is. That's immense. That's mm -hmm. amazing. That's never been the case in camera technology ever before. And I was talking about pinhole camera. But, okay. um, you know, because with film, there's guesswork. Um, with, with digital, with DSLRs, that's guesswork. You know, until you look at the screen, you can you can check your image much more quickly than you can on a film. But still, when you actually, at the moment when you're taking the image, you still don't really know what the image is going to look like since you're actually looking at the actual visual mm -hmm. the scene on you know uh, through the viewfinder. Um, but when mirrorless first came out, I mean there was there was an argument to say like oh well EVFs you know the disadvantage is is that the resolution is not as high as when you look through glass mm -hmm. and see something, and uh, and also um, there's a problem in what would happen when you press the shutter button very often, especially with, uh, with sort of fast continuous, um, shots, like in sports, for example, in wildlife, if you're photographing a bird, um, it, the image would disappear for a split second and it would be right. put up again. And so, you know, it'd be difficult to follow a bird. I mean, all of these issues have been addressed. And if you look at the newer, um, EVFs that are coming out now in particular, like with the new Sony's and the new Nikon, I mean, these are like 5 million pixels. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you know, that looks just as good as... as oh, I'm sure it does. I've, I've not looked through one yet, so I, I can't say for sure, but my GH5S has somewhere close to three and a half, mm. and I can assure you that looks cracking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so I mean, I, I can see what it's saying, but I'm... It just sounds like marketing waffle to me. It's an argument that doesn't hold any water. Yeah, anymore. I mean, that's, that's, I find it, I find it very hard to buy into all these arguments. Um, but that's again, that's just my personal opinion. Mm. If anybody's got any uh, opinions in that, then please let us know. You can, uh, of course, either email us um, or you can just leave a comment on uh, on Facebook. It'd be great to, to get people's opinions and just mm. to see what what people out there think. Are you a Pentax shooter? And uh, what's your opinion? Um, how, how do you feel about the prospect of of Pandax not moving into the mirrorless market, um, and I don't know, I don't know what the what Pandax shooters' general expectation was whether they were waiting for Pandax to move into mirrorless or not. Or, but I, you know, it'd be interesting to find question. out. Good question. I'm not sure I yeah. know any at the moment. So um, it'd be interesting to kind of to get an opinion. Yeah, on absolutely. So, yeah. so absolutely. if you shoot Pandax, please get in touch. Let us know uh, what you think. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's basically what I've got on the camera front this week. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. It's been a good week. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I think it's time to go sleep <laughs> for the next yeah, three days. I can't just yet. <laughs> Maybe soon. Yeah. <laughs> so remember, if um, um, if you want to take part in this month's uh, mm. photo challenge, um, it's landscapes. Uh, could be any any landscape whatsoever. Uh, please send in your photos. Uh, again, email them to us, cameraShakePodcast at gmail.com or send it, send it over on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash cameraShakePodcast. Um, and we'll be talking about, well, we know, in about two two or three episodes time, yep. we'll be talking about the, um, the result of that challenge. So that's all we've got this week. That was episode 13 of the Camera Shake Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and uh, again, get in touch. Let us know what you think. Um, without further ado, we'll see you next Thursday.